<laughs> this is great. This well, that's great. Welcome, uh, welcome to the White House. And uh, it's nice to have you here. It's particularly nice to have uh, a group from uh, my home base. Uh, right here. Uh, I, th I think probably the best thing is just to uh, go ahead and throw it out to questions, except to say that uh, I think it's uh, it's very important for you to come back to Washington and see this process up close. I think the most important point I can make uh, that I've always made to groups coming back here is that you can read about this in your, in your government books. You can read about it. You know, I went through political science. I studied, uh, I studied all of the government courses in high school when I was at Monterey High. And then when I went to uh, San Perry University, I took political science. And uh, then obviously went on to law school and uh, you know, took some studies in, uh, in politics, even in law school. But if you, whatever you read, even whatever you see, I think doesn't bring it home until you come back here and actually see that this really is a people process. Uh, the greatness of our democracy is that it really is a process made up of a cross-section of this country and that you're dealing with human beings. And they bring all of their passions, all of their loves, all of their hates. Uh, some are bright, some are not so bright. Uh, it is very much a cross-section of our society. That's both a, uh, an encouraging and frightening time, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the reality. And uh, it, it is it is a great thought of our forefathers is that it, you know, if, if you bring people together in this kind of process with the proper checks and balances that we have within our Constitution, that ultimately the right things are done. Uh, and the reality is that it's worked. It's worked for over 200 years. And I think uh, all of you need to, uh, to understand that. This really is a people process. It's true for Capitol Hill. It's true for the White House. Uh, and, uh, it's true for all of us that work here. It's true for the President of the United States. Uh, and so understand that. This is truly a people process. And people like yourselves, are the very people that uh, are here. And uh, it makes our system not only one in which there's great interchange, but it also gives all of you the capacity to participate in our system, to be part of it, whether it's at the local level, at the community level, or at the Washington level. I in, never in my dreams expected that at some point in my life I'd be working in the Oval Office with the President of the United States. That is just not something I ever imagined. I was interested in government thought that I would be involved in government in some capacity, um, but I basically thought I'd wind up, you know, a small town lawyer working with my brother uh, and have the opportunity to come back here and be a part of this, uh, this great world here. But it's, it also tells each of you that uh, this is a country in which whatever your dreams are, you know, you can achieve those dreams and be a part of it. Uh, that certainly has been the case with me, and I'm just the son of uh, Italian immigrants who came to this country. I, they had very little. They didn't know anybody. They had no power. They did not make a contribution to campaigns. They were very much people that basically worked hard, put money aside, got us through school. But ultimately, we made use of the opportunity that was given us in this country. So the important thing for all of you is to make use of the opportunity that you have in this country, to learn from this trip about what our country is all about, uh, and that public service, giving something back to this country, is extremely important. And it doesn't mean that uh, all of you have to be in politics. It, it means through your own professions, through your own uh, areas of work and endeavor, you can still give something back to the community. I guess that's the one thing my father always said, that this country has an awful lot to give back to us. But we, in turn, should give something back to this country as well. And that's what makes our system great. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, I'd like to know uh, what were the forces that um, propelled you into public service? Um, I was elected student body president of Monterey High School. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I guess uh, I was always uh, I was always interested in uh, student affairs, and uh, I really did get involved in student body work. Uh, very early on, I, mean, I was a, an officer in my class uh, as a freshman, and then I got involved in student council, you know, as a student council representative, and then was elected vice president of the student body, and then ultimately president of the student body. And uh, that's where I got, you know, I just, uh, I, I really liked it. I liked uh, 
I like working in those in that capacity. I also like you know dealing with issues. And uh, then when I went to college and uh, got into political science, I also got involved in student body affairs there. So uh, I have to tell you that you know I really I honestly think that it was uh, my involvement in student government that uh, really got me interested in it. And then it was also uh, I think it was also my parents who uh, really thought that uh, working in public service was important. Those two things. And frankly, when I got, I mean, my first, uh, just to give you an idea, when I first got out, of, I got out of law school and I, had to, I served in the Army for two years. And when I was getting out of the Army, uh, I, I either had the choice of going back into a small town practice or trying to see if I could get involved in, in government. So I wrote, at the time, uh, a fellow who was an aide to the president, that is Lyndon Johnson, sorry, and the name of the aide was Joe Califano. Now, I didn't know Joe Califano, but I figured anybody named Califano. <laughs> so I wrote, this is true, this is true, I wrote Joe Califano, and I said, there Miss Califano, I'm like, well, I know you're a son of Italian, <laughs> uh, um, you know, you're working there, and I'm very interested in coming back to Washington. And sure enough, tells you that blood is thicker than... <laughs> uh, we, we, he basically set up several appointments for me when I came back. Those days, if you wore a military uniform, you'd get a cheaper ticket on a plane. So I wore my uniform, came back to uh, Washington, uh, went to a number of uh, interviews. I went to the Defense Department, uh, I think I went to the Justice Department, uh, a couple other departments, and then I went up to Capitol Hill because I was really interested in the Congress and uh, went into a senator's office from California at the time. And they, they happened to have an opening for a legislative assistant, and that's how I got the job. I didn't, I mean, I knew, I did not know the senator. You know, I was not involved in party politics, to be truthful. I was just, you know, I just kind of walked in and uh, got the job there, and that's what got me started. I was a legislative assistant of Capitol Hill uh, for almost three years, and then I became uh, director of the Office of Civil Rights uh, Department, the old Department of uh, Health, Education, and Welfare. Uh, worked in New York City as uh, an aide to the mayor and then ran for Congress after that. Our uh, classmates were um, privileged enough to speak with you um, when you were in the house. And after a short stint at the OMB, you're now the chief of staff. I'm wondering, uh, you know that, right? <laughs> 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 How, how has your perspective of government changed uh, over this time? Uh, I would not I would not do this work. I, I would not have been congressman and I would not have been director of OMB uh, if I did not really have a great deal of hope about our process. Uh, I I am just I am ver I'm a very deep believer that despite all of the anger and uh, despite all of those the loud voices that you hear out there and despite all of the questions that all of us need to have about you know how effectively government works and all of its problems that ultimately our system really is the best system in the world and that ultimately if that, that I, I guess I'm a believer that the good in people can overwhelm the dark side. And I know there's a dark side out there. I mean, we see it all the time. But I also know that deep down, people really want good to succeed. And that despite their own emotions, despite the fact that all of us kind of, you know, there's always a tendency in all of us to kind of paint issues as black and white. You know, it's either all good or all bad or like that. The reality is that most issues are not all black or all white, they're gray. You've got to work your way through them. You've got to talk them through because they're tough issues. Uh, but I think ultimately that if you if you're straight with people about the issues that we have to confront, that people respond to them, and that ultimately you can get people to try to work together and get the job done. Now that's not to say that this town hasn't gotten meaner in the last few years. I mean, when I first came to Washington in the mid '60s, 
uh, there was a different kind of relationship among Republicans and Democrats. I mean, even on Capitol Hill. I worked at that time for a moderate Republican from uh, California. Uh, but he got along with Democrats. And even though you may have differences on some issues, there was always a willingness to try to work together to find answers to problems. Uh, what's happened in the last few years, and it's true for both parties, is just that it's gotten a lot more political, a lot more parts, and a lot meaner as a result of that. So that everybody, rather than trying to somehow confront the issues, which are tough to do, budget issues, all the other issues that confront our society, that everybody kind of looks for a way to score political points as opposed to trying to find answers. So it's gotten to be a much tougher atmosphere. Nevertheless, I still find that even when it comes to dealing with, you know, either foreign affairs issues that, you know, in which people try to pull together, or even, for example, on the anti-terrorism legislation that we're doing as a result of Oklahoma City, that we're getting a lot more people that are willing to cooperate and try to work together on those kinds of issues. So you really got to you've got to keep pushing on it. And uh, I, I guess if, if if I've seen anything in the time I've been back here, it's that it's much tougher. It's just gotten much tougher to try to get good people to come forward. And it's also gotten much tougher to try to talk in a quieter voice about the problems that face us. Uh, because we are at a time when just, you know, people are kind of yelling at each other rather than just talking to each other. Uh, this was a country in which we really did it. I mean, we used to we used to spend much more time talking to each other, whether it was in the family or whether it was at work. Uh, and now because we're in the information age and everybody can kind of do their own thing and listen to their own thing and stand at a, you know, a corner desk with a, something over their ears uh, and kind of tune in to the world on their own, we don't talk as much to each other. And I think that's a problem. I mean, I think we need to, if there's anything we need to stress now, it's the need for people talk more to each other, and to talk about issues. I, I spoke to the publishers uh, a couple weeks ago, the country's publisher. I said it's really important to the publishers in this country. If they would and, and not only you know present the news in as objective a, a way as possible, but they ought to sponsor forums and communities where people can come together to talk about issues. Not, you know, not to listen to people yell at each other, but to really try to talk your way through issues whether it's affirmative action, whether it's issues related to immigration, whether it's issues related to crime, whether it's talking about the militias, whether I mean, whatever it is. We've got to talk through these issues. Because in every issue, there's a legitimate concern that's there. And the struggle is to try to find the right answer. But it isn't going to happen if we just kind of bash each other. It's only going to happen if we kind of talk through it. We've got to get back to that. That's probably the most important thing I can say for all of you is I think, you know, we've got to be talking to each other a lot more than we do. What's the most challenging aspect of the job? This is, uh, I, I mean, I, if somebody had described this job, I mean, I, there's nobody that could adequately describe what this job is about. I, I can't do it. It's, uh, I thought I went from the frying pan to the fire when I was OMB director. I, I've gone into the oven. <laughs> <laughs> in this job, it's uh, in this in this job, you obviously you have to. What happens is all the issues that flow to the president flow to the chief's office, and you've got to basically be on top of the issues and the crises that that affect uh, the country as they as they flow to the president. Try to give the president the most organized presentation of those issues, but it means you have to deal with an awful lot. It, it, it wouldn't be so bad if you just kind of, uh, you know, in an organized way, you say, okay, these are the issues that we're going to be trying to develop over this period of time. And you can basically organize that. But what you can't organize are the crises. And the crises, I mean, it, it's not like, you know, in Congress you could deal with a crisis, but then you could kind of sit back and say, you know, hey, uh, I don't have to worry about, you know, uh, the crisis basically destroying the, the, the country or the world. Crises here are serious. These are these are heavy crises, and so every one of them demands you know an awful lot of attention, and and, and you've got to be able to try to 
bring those issues into a tight fit so that the president can see those issues, know what the options are, and then move forward. So that's one challenge, one great challenge is the ability to kind of put your hand around all the crises and the issues that you deal with so that you're on top of it. Because so much is coming at you. I mean, I, I start at 7 o'clock in the morning, I don't get out of here till 10 or 11 o'clock, sometimes 12 o'clock at night. Because there's so much that you're trying to get your hand around. The other thing is that uh, I have a, a president who is, we all have a president who is very energetic. I, mean, I, I thought I was a hard worker. I mean, I thought, you know, nobody can kind of outwork me. Um, boy, was I wrong. This guy is, you know, he's just, he's constantly, he's constantly putting his arms around issues. He wants to, you know, th th anything that comes across him, he's a voracious reader. So he reads books, he reads, you know, articles, anything you send to him, he reads. Uh, and he's got notes coming back, so he's just constantly churning out issues. So, you know, there are moments when I'd like to have a quiet Ronald Reagan. These are your cards for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we had a very interesting interview yesterday with Secretary Babbitt, and when she told us something about the demands of public life, do you feel you've had to pay a personal price in order to pursue a life in public service? And do you think we expect too much of our public servants? That's a very good question. I think uh, it's. Uh... These, these challenges, by their very nature, are very consuming, uh, and you you really do have to be careful of your personal relationship and your family relationship in the context, because the challenges in a political job, it's not just here, it's in Congress or almost uh, in the state level, what have you, uh, can be very consuming. I, I guess, you know, we talk about a political job because of the pressures involved in it, it's probably true for any job you're in. Uh, I think it's extremely important in these jobs to make very sure that you kind of always maintain your perspective in these jobs because they are so consuming that sometimes you lose your perspective. When I was a congressman, I used to go to California every weekend. People used to think that was crazy that I would fly to California every weekend. But one of the reasons for that was not only to get back to my district and my family, it, you know, my wife uh, ran my all of my offices out there, and my kids were out there in school. It's not only to get to them, but it was also to get out of this town and to kind of restore your perspective about, because the things that are important in Washington, and you know, we read the Washington Post and everybody's kind of into who's trying to screw who, but the reality is when we leave this town, it's very different. People see, have, have different concerns because they're away from that, and so you're much more involved with the kind of day-to-day -day lives of people who get out. So maintaining your perspective is very important. Maintaining your relationship with your family is extremely important. I, I, and I can't say this for everybody because everybody's got to kind of work these things through, but my wife was very much involved with the work that I did. And so she was, she ran my field offices out in the district. I had five field offices. I had one in Santa Cruz, Monterey, uh, Hollister, San Luis Obispo, and Salinas. And uh, we had people in each of those offices. She worked out of the Monterey office. She did. She basically oversaw all the casework. She did my scheduling. It's always nice to have your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend it. You nuts! You want to go to that event? But so she did my schedule. What what it did was it helped us because then uh, on Saturdays I had three sons. We had three sons. Uh, and so on Saturdays they were involved in sports. We always set aside time to go to their games. If there was an event, you know, that involved the school on Friday or Saturday night, I'd go out and get that. I always tried to make room to do that. Uh, and and it worked out. Actually, it worked out very well because if you come back, I know there are some people that bring their families back here. The problem is you've also got to go to your district. I wanted my district to be the place to be my home, and this was a place where I worked. But I, since I was born in Monterey, uh, that's my home. 
and I wanted it to be that for my kids as well. Uh, it, it worked for us because my wife, because of her involvement in what was going on in the district offices, knew what issues I was dealing with back here. It was not a question of isolating her uh, from the issues that I was dealing with. She was very much involved in the issues that I was dealing with. And that helped actually build an even stronger relationship between my wife and I and our, and our son. And it worked for us. I mean, our sons are doing, thank God. I mean, in the end, let me tell you, for all of the success you can have in politics, there is nothing more important than to know that your children are on their way, are on their way. That's really great satisfaction. My, my oldest is practicing law in Los Angeles, passed the bar, went to UCLA and passed the bar last summer. My second is uh, in residency in uh, medical school in New York and uh, is completing residency in going to cardiology. And the third is at Santa Clara at, uh, in law school. So, I mean, they're all, they're all doing well. But I think uh, a lot of credit goes to my wife because she basically, at the same time she was running my office, it's had to assume a lot of the responsibility. Having said all of that, your question is, you know, in these kinds of jobs, does that create additional pressures in terms of your relationship, your family relationship? The answer is yes. And anybody who says it doesn't, something's wrong. It does, just by the nature of it. These are time-consuming jobs. There's a lot of pressure in these jobs. You, you, know, you, you, you have to vent the pressure in some ways. And so you really do need, as, as I started off this discussion with, you've got to talk. And you've got to talk with each other. And you've got to talk as a family together. And if you do that, you know, I think you, you can strengthen your relationship. The worst thing I've seen happen in this is that people start to become strangers to each other. And when that happens, when you become strangers with your children, that's the worst thing that happens. So there are, there are strains in these jobs. There's no question about it. But I, I happen to believe that probably we live in a society where almost whether you're a lawyer or a doctor or anything else, there are strains uh, in that relationship. I, my, you know, the one thing I, I, I have family in Italy still that we visit. And uh, the one difference I, I, I've seen in the Italians, and it's probably true for others, is that they know how to enjoy life and they also know how to enjoy their families. And they do not put as much into their jobs as we do in this country. Uh, you know, I, mean, it, it, I think we might learn something by understanding the importance of the relationship in our families and meeting, for that matter, in our communities than in the job that we're, we're in. We, there's a, this country, I think we're still, it must be the frontier spirit or whatever, whatever the hell it is. We always are driven in the jobs that we're in. Society basically drives you that to always be successful or always outgun the person that you're competing with. And that's part of the nature of our society. But I think there's really something to be said about taking the quiet moments and enjoying life a little bit. And uh, that's the one thing, frankly, the one thing I miss in this job is not being able to go to California as much as I should, as I could, as congressman, because I, I lose touch with that little bit of life out there that helps restore your spirit and your perspective. Let me take one more question. Of which of your many accomplishments, accomplishments are you most proud of? Uh, I think my, my best accomplishment is uh, is making uh, Monterey Bay a National Marine Sanctuary. Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 always, I always think about that because I love the bay out there, I love the ocean. And uh, at the time I fought uh, an awful lot against the threat of offshore drilling off of our coastline. And uh, there were some real threats at one point. And to, to be able to have put that whole area of the central coast uh, into a National Marine Sanctuary and know that it's always going to be preserved for my kids and their kids down the road. I think that's the greatest satisfaction. We had, we had one question that we closed all our interviews with. and if, if you, One short one. If Right now, if you, had, if you were giving a message to the American public that we need to hear, what do we need to hear? I... I, I think the most important message to the American people is uh, is to have hope and not to, 
and not be tied up in fear. Uh, that's that's the most important thing. Uh, there's a lot of fear out there. We we fear for you know whether we can make it each day, whether it's, whether our families are going to be secure. We worry about you know whether we're going to be able to uh, succeed. Uh, and we hear a lot of voices out there that basically breed a lot of fear. And so my great, my greatest concern right now is that we can be consumed by that kind of fear. But if you listen to some of the, the language that that the people in the militia, for example, are talking about, where they think that the government is out to get them, and that the UN is coming here, and that there is a kind of one world government that is ready to demand and take over, it is, I mean, you know, you say, well, that's nuts, it's crazy. But it's built on a fear out there. And, and you know, whatever facts are out there kind of adds to it. And people then, I mean, it, it can drive you to the kinds of things we saw happen in Oklahoma City. That suddenly somebody thinks that it's so real and that the threat is so real that they're willing to blow up a federal building as their way of trying to prevent this from happening. I mean, that's the kind of crazy psychology that's out there. And I see that not only there, but I see it on other issues. I mean, and you can see it sometimes on, on issues that you deal with back here. It's all built on fear, you know, uh, the fear of, uh, of, of, uh, of minorities, the fear of immigrants, the fear of, I mean, everything, there's a lot of fear that drives a lot of issues that we deal with. And we have got to be a nation of hope and that we can always confront these things, that we can do better. And I think to the extent that we recognize that hope and that, and that we can really work together to try to solve these problems, that's the most important message we need to hear right now. It's not only true for here, it's true for the world. We're at a time when we have a lot of transition going on in the world. There are a lot of countries that are suddenly understanding what a democracy is all about. And they're having to face all of the same kinds of issues. Uh, you can imagine what it's like in uh, in Poland or Czechoslovakia or South Africa to suddenly deal with the whole challenge of becoming a democracy. You probably, you talk about fear, I'm sure there are all kinds of fears about whether they can make it. Uh, and so the world is going through that, Russia is going through that as they try to deal with their problems. Uh, and, and so I, I think the most important thing right now is that people have to be hopeful that we can confront these issues. And if, if we can do that, we'll make it. We'll make it. Okay, guys.